Welcome to the Tyneside Irish Cultural Society podcast with me, Michael McNally. Hi, and welcome to the October Tyneside Irish Cultural Society podcast. In this month's programme, we'll have live music performance, as always. We'll be talking about the recent creative writing competition, and I'll be updating you on the Irish Community News. On Thursday the 19th of November, the Cultural Society will be hosting its first online event. There will be a celebration of the life and work of Belfast poet and musician Kieran Carson by Durham University Professor Stephen Regan. He'll be joined by other academics and musicians who will read and play some of his work. You can watch live online via Zoom and there will also be a question and answer session. You'll also be able to watch this later on YouTube as it's being recorded. Just send the Cultural Society an email at tyneirishcs at gmail.com and they'll send you an invitation link. That's tyneirishcs at gmail.com. OK, I'm now in my brother's recording studio down in Jarrow um, because we're rehearsing for a gig this coming Saturday at the Lakeside. And... Uh, it's always a pleasure. I haven't seen much of them during the coronavirus thing, but this is a work occasion, so we're together rehearsing. And my brother's Tony McNally, and uh, he's been up to some quite interesting bits and pieces recently, so I thought I'd have a little chat with him. Right, you've been really busy, even though it's been uh, lockdown. I know you've been travelling a bit, and uh, you've been doing really well with your tone alley, which is a, the thing you invented, which won awards, a, 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 drum, teacher, a drum training device. That's right, d d drum teaching tool for uh, beginners to advanced players, really. It, uh, it's the first in the world to train the trajectory of the drumstick. So it eradicates stroke slice and basically assists you to become an even better player. It's pretty cool. Excellent, what else have you not do? Um, well, we've uh, also, uh, my company, Tonali Limited, have um, taken on the organization of uh, the Drum Off UK, um, which is a drum competition um, for soloists, drum soloists. Um, they have to record a four minute drum solo, send that to an organization called Drum Off Global, which are based in um, uh, Singapore. And then what happens is um, all 190 odd countries who enter the competition, their winners are pooled together and then a judging panel pick out the best and the winners actually get flown to Canada to perform on a really cool drumming station called Drumio, which is the biggest online drumming presence on the planet. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, that's, that's it. So what, what's your involvement? Are you sponsoring that? Uh, I'm sponsoring it uh, via Tonali and um, uh, I'm organising it. The judging panel for the UK that I've, I've managed to pull together are um, Derek McKenzie, who plays with Jamiroquai. We've got Gary Wallace, who plays with Pink Floyd, of course. He's awesome. They're all awesome. Dean Duke. Um, we've got Ian Matthews, uh, Kasabian's drummer. Roger Hemsell, uh, a well-known educationalist in the northeast of England. And Ian Palmer, who's a relative of Carl Palmer, um, a great drummer there. Emerson Lake Emerson Palmer. Lake Palmer, of course. Wow. So, I wish I could play the drums, I would end up. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't ever let me on the kit, that's why. I, like, uh, on, on that note, you've got a very nice new kit here, which I haven't seen before. Uh, yes. Let's have a little look at this. Uh, actually, there's a bit of a uh, story this? to tell with this one, mate. Yeah, I've, I've only just got an endorsement from a, the, the most beautiful drums, um, drum makers. And uh, apart from being the most beautiful to look at, they sound absolutely fantastic too. Um, let me just show you what the uh, what they do have. Can you get your camera around here at all, Michael? Yeah. Um, over here we've got this tuning device, which you'll often find on a an upright bass guitar, um, and that is uh, a machine head. Right. That tunes with this wire here. This way I certainly can. Let me oh, use this drum here. Look. Okay. I'll just use one of these silent sticks here. So I've got this key here on the side of this drum. Yeah. It's like half 
have an, um, an orchestral set of timpani yeah. all of a sudden for your regular drum kit. Great, um, hey, Ant, I'm very impressed, Ant. Right, listen, I haven't got a lot of time. Would you like to play something on the, the mandolin for us, eh? Oh, yeah, why That'd not? Brilliant. <laughs> Once to enter that drum competition, I think the entries um, you can enter up till the 8th of November, so that's the cutoff point. So, if you know any good drummers, get them to enter this competition because it's worldwide and it's very exciting. It'd be nice to have a northeastern drummer and particularly one of Irish descent perhaps winning it. That would be sensational. Anyway, moving on, we recently had a, a creative writing competition and Apparently there was some really high quality work and we had some uh, extremely impressive judges involved, Pete Mortimer and a very good friend of mine from the past, Heather King. And I'm now going to say hello to Heather, who's on the other side. Hiya, Heather, how are you doing? Oh, marvellous, considering, Mike, considering. It's difficult to have this separation from theatre and cinema um, it feeds people like us, doesn't it? And we need to be out there and be involved. Absolutely, and it, really challenging times. But I have to say, I'm, I'm over the moon to see you, and it's it's lovely to see you looking so well too. Uh, we we worked years ago. Uh, I, I worked at the same time. You were there a lot longer than I was at Tiny T's Television, and it's it's gone through a lot of transitions in, in recent years. Um, could you just tell those who don't realise what your role was? at Tiny T's television? Well, you know, I started on the shop floor right at the bottom. I was a, I first of all was a performer and that was how I was picked up to work there. I was doing a double act with my husband, uh, Joe Ging, whom everybody knows and remembers with great fondness. And I started at Tiny T's as a production assistant. And then I was a vision mixer and then I was a researcher, and I climbed the ladder to being a producer. It took quite a long while and quite a lot of determination. And eventually I was head of arts and entertainment, which was a fantastic job because I had the most talented of teams. 
uh, boys and girls, men and women, um, who really, I just let them rip. <laughs> they won a lot of awards and I just let them rip. They were absolutely wonderful. You know, you were very highly regarded when I was working there, um, back in the late 89, 90 time. And of course, you mentioned Joe, your, your, your husband, what a wonderful man, great talent. And I sadly missed him. And, and I, you know, I had the pleasure of, of, of spending quite a bit of time with him over a few year periods with uh, Sammy Johnson, Ronnie Johnson. And oh, okay. uh, they were great friends. And, and okay. yes, yeah, sadly missed. Fantastic judge for this competition, you know, given all your experience. And what, what was the criteria for the competition? I continue to be an audience member whenever I go to the theatre or whenever I go to the cinema or if ever I pick up a story, I just wait for it to grab me. I, I don't, I've never laid down any criteria in my mind when I pick up um, a piece of something to read. Um, it's important that the writer has a passion to tell, tell a story. And it's important that the writer has a love of words. Uh, and apart from that, just get cracking and write. There were two categories, there's um, fiction and non-fiction. And were you surprised by the quality of the writing that you, you came across? Like it is remarkable how many of our friends and colleagues have a lot of talent, a lot of singing talent, creative talent, writing talent. It, it never surprises me. What, what, what I'm getting from what you're saying is this, um, you have to feel moved, you have to feel the passion, you have to feel yes. there's a wordsmith involved and, and, and th therefore it has an impact on you, um, which I totally agree with. Um, are there any sort of new bestsellers? Is there anyone who sort of stood out? I, I know one of the, the winners won in a first prize and a third prize in two separate categories. This this lady does have writing talent, um, but you know there there was a certain person among this group that um, had never written before. I would say, uh, but he had a life story to tell, which was absolutely fantastic, and I got as much joy reading what he had written about his life as I did from the other rather um, rather more experienced people, let's say, who'd been writing before. He, I got as much pleasure out of him uh, as I did uh, out of the winners of the competition. All of the people in the competition had something to say and all of them gave pleasure they had something to tell me. Would you, what advice would you give to anyone who perhaps hasn't written before and wants to have a go? Oh, I, I always give the same advice. Just write. People come to me and they've come to me over the years in my different roles as firstly a producer and then as an agent. And uh, even nowadays, people ask me what they should do just write. Nobody's going to, going to do it for you. What it does take is a lot of determination, a lot of energy. It takes a lot of energy to sit down in a lonely room at a lonely desk and get something down on paper. And that's what you've got to steal yourself for. You've really got to want to communicate. I'm lucky my daughter's started writing. She's just doing a master's um, down in Sheffield oh, yeah. and oh, she wonderful. absolutely loves writing. So I, she has a passion for it. I'm so proud of her. Um, I wish I could find the time personally or the motivation to sit and write stuff down. I, I struggle. Um, when I do, I, I'm all right. I'm not brilliant, but I'm all right. But um, Bob Smeaton, I, I'm sure you'll remember Bob wrote his book. Of course. About, which which he, he told me, he said, Michael, everybody needs to write a book. And it's not about getting the book out there for everyone to read, it's for yourself. Write it for yourself. And I thought that was really interesting, you know, from a lad who was from the shipyards, who didn't go to university, who's had a fantastic career. Um, well, Michael, I, I think everybody has a book in them. I really believe that. 
but it's a question of whether they've got the guts <laughs> to get that book out. That's, that's what it's all about. My mother wrote, um, I think you had a piece in, in your paper mentioning my mother. When she retired, she wouldn't write anymore. And I used to say, well, now you've got the time. Why don't you write? Well, she felt it was a lonely business and she felt living on her own, the one thing she needed to do was get out. It is a lonely business being a writer. You've really got to have that energy and passion and want to get it down on paper. You know, if I have something, I have to write. Um, and I, usually it's for the theatre that I work for. Um, I sit down and I, it takes me forever. You, I edit it and I look at it and I read it and the energy and time it takes is absolutely enormous. But I feel delighted when I've done it. <laughs> and it's, it's been a while, but you never change. And a great pleasure, Michael. Lovely to see you. And, and the, the one thing I did want to say today was how much I love the Irish and the Irish descended. And that was one of the things that um, drew me to this. You know, my, my dear friend, Tony Corcoran, who's been a friend of mine as long as you have, um, uh, uh, got me involved. And I love the Irish Centre and the people there. Everybody talks to you. It's great. I've been delighted to be involved. Ah, oh, that's great, Heather. You take care. Okay? And lovely to talk to you. Thank you. Once again, uh, I'd like to say a big thank you to Heather Ging and Pete Mortimer for judging the creative writing competition. Uh, the, the, the winners were, um, in the non-fiction category, Sue Miller with The Repair Shop. She won first prize. And Laura McDonough was second with Back to Ireland. And third prize went to John McGowan for his story, Roger McGowan. In the fiction category, first prize went to David Coulthard with Brand New Shoes. Second prize went to Nora Buck with Upon Reflection. And third prize to Sue Miller, who also won the other category, with her story still breathing. Congratulations to all the winners and to everyone who participated. It takes uh, quite a bit of effort to sit and write and a lot of patience. And I know the standard was really appreciated by both judges. So well done, everyone. Um, the Irish News, Irish Community News. I would really recommend you read it. It's always a good read. And this month, there's some really interesting stuff in there, um, including a new competition, a Christmas card competition. Um, have a look at that. Um, a really good article on... Billy Bingham, the football legend, footballer who played for Sunderland and was manager of Northern Ireland um, by a very good friend of mine, Mr. Brian McNally, superb journalistic skills. Uh, great to have him writing for the Irish Community News. There are also some fantastic um, tributes in there as well. Um, so have a little look if you get a chance. Um, on a sporting note, this month has been quite a remarkable one for one or two of my friends. One of them, Carl Mowat, uh, at the weekend, 24th of October, they ran 101.4 miles, 101.4 miles in 23 hours to raise funds to buy a guide dog. And uh, quite a remarkable feat, I have to say. So congratulations, Carl. But I'm now going to have a chat with a, another friend of mine who just returned last week from his trip to Ireland, where he went on kind of an adventure. This is David Sheeran. Hi, David Sheeran. Tell me about your recent adventure. Yeah, uh, just back from Ireland last week, Michael. I ran uh, across Ireland from the west coast to the east coast in four days for 
a dog shelter that I was volunteering for. So, well, I still do, but the sort of participation is limited now with the with the COVID restrictions. So, yeah, I started volunteering there in in February, January, February. I wanted to do something special. So, um, yeah, as soon as I got the chance to do it, I've done it. Just ran, raised some money for it, and it's in the bag now. So, just reveling in the achievement. But let's get this right, you ran 120 miles in four days? Yeah, yeah, it was um, It was going to be more, actually, there's a few places I wanted to see, just out of, just wanted to go visit there from when I lived there, there was a few things off me, sort of, to, to visit list that I never got around to doing, so um, it was places like Cross McGlen, which ended up too far, uh, it would have made one of the days just too long, so... I cut that out. It was going to be 130. I ended up doing 125, I think, in the end. So. So tell us some of the places that you stopped at on the way. Um, the first night was in... Uh, uh, a lot of people know this from Ireland, from Donegal, to where a lot of Irish people in the northwest spend their summer holidays. Uh, a place called Bundoran. Second night, Enniskillen. Um, a couple of Tyneside Irish lads I'm thinking of uh, who hailed from there. Third night was Monaghan. Uh, fourth night was Newry. And then I finished in Newcastle, County Down. So. It's quite a challenge to do on your own. Did you have any friends meet up with you to run with you any of the sections? The, the COVID restrictions made it a bit tricky for people to devote a bit of time to it. And running 30 miles a day isn't everyone's cup of tea. So I had a few friends join us for bits and pieces of it. My friend Damien Coyle, he ran... And Gareth Kelly, he ran the first, some of the first day, sort of a half marathon. The second day, my good friend in Enniskillen, Ronan Owens, who's a hell of a runner now. He never used to be. He used to be a, a hell of a drinker in the house centre, but he's a runner now. And he was injured, but he strategically laid out food all along the route in Fermanagh for us on that second day, which was a great help. Just as nice, just as good a support as it would have been along having a runner alongside us. Spent day three on my own, didn't really know anyone around Armagh, that type of direction. And on the fourth day, a really good friend of mine, Ryan Moore, he came and um, met us in Silent Valley. I had, the last day I was just full of adrenaline, wanted to finish and was putting, getting put under pressure by me B&B to get in for a certain time. So I raced the first 20 mile. I would have probably done one of my best ever marathon times actually for the first bit. But my friend Ryan was there about yeah early on and we ran the last 11 miles together which just flew in you know it's still it, it, it's still really one of the best things I've done with my life to be honest I never thought it would go off so successfully so and that's that's fantastic it's a great achievement David and uh, you know you, you, you rightfully feel proud of it because it's it's fantastic now how much money did you raise by the time it comes back it's going to be roughly about 1500 I think I just want to say a huge thank you for your time again and well done congratulations no problem at all no problem, Michael. Thanks a lot. Brilliant. Thank you. I'm afraid that's all we have time for this month. Thank you very much to all the contributors. Now, you might have noticed that the title music is performed by a very talented musician, Matt Dean. And I'm really pleased to say we've got him to play us out for the month of October. Happy Halloween, everyone. And I look forward to seeing you all in November. All the very best.